Around the world, 20 to 30 percent of greenhouse gas emissions are attributable to transportation. Most of that is road transportation from motor vehicles. So this is where we must concentrate much of our effort. In my country, the USA, it's about 29 percent, so it's very high within that range. And this is where I see the greatest opportunity for reducing greenhouse gas emissions because we have these also in agriculture, we have this also in energy um, generation, but uh, it may be the greatest opportunity is in transport. Before I even answer that question, I would like to question the very interest in maintaining the extremely energy intensive transport that we have. If we were to imagine that it would become technologically feasible for that to be sustainable, just for the sake of argument, another question would be, why do we want that? It also incurs problems of, of uh, expense, of safety. The more you drive, the more risk exposure you have, such that even if the driving becomes safer, the increasing driving negates that benefit. So I want to question the question, so to speak. But then, if I accept the question, I then have to ask, well, how? How is this supposed to be possible? Um, battery electric vehicles can offer us a little bit, but nothing like what has been promised. Um, so I don't see a way for the answer to that to be yes, even if we agree that the question is the right question. No. I think this is an absurdity invented by marketing. Marketing, your, your purpose in marketing is, is to sell and the truth is not relevant. And we have been sold a story that um, robotic vehicles will make it possible for efficiencies to grow to the point that it becomes sustainable. I think this is almost self-evidently absurd. Uh, the kinds of efficiencies they talk about uh, are, are insignificant compared to the energy intensity of the transportation demands they're talking about. I would also question this adjective smart. I think it's a bogus adjective. I don't think it, it has any validity. The smartest component in an ordinary automobile is the human driver and any robotic or computerized substitute for that driver can barely compete uh, for real adaptable, versatile um, intelligence uh, on the road. In, what we have in terms of robotic cars are quite stupid by comparison to a human being. So automation is a familiar word. We speak about automation since the 19th century. Um, autonomous is, I think, a completely bogus term when we're speaking about engineering. I've had engineers object to me when I say this, and they say, well, in engineering, we have a special sense of the word autonomy. We don't mean the machine actually has a, a will or discretion or intentions of its own. We have a specialized term as engineers. And I wondered, well, how could that be since, in fact, your purpose in so-called autonomy is to develop a machine that is incapable of doing anything other than what you want it to do which means that you actually want a deterministic machine. And a deterministic machine is the opposite of an autonomous machine. Challenged by their questions, I looked into the origin of the engineering sense of the word autonomous, and it's complete nonsense. The original engineering use was at NASA, where in the 1960s, NASA said, we want an autonomous space capsule design. Can you give us your designs? They said this to companies. And what they meant was, we want a space capsule that has a window so that the human crew can work like Magellan did with celestial navigation. And that will give the space capsule independence from signals from Earth. And that's what they meant by autonomy. And by that standard, the original engineering sense of autonomy, a ordinary car from 1950 is autonomous because the driver can see and steer. So that's what autonomy really meant. It was at the Pentagon in the 1980s 
that Pentagon bureaucrats decided to call robotic systems autonomous systems, presumably because they sounded more impressive this way. It's, it's not only inaccurate, it's a deception, because an autonomous vehicle, what they really mean is a vehicle that has no autonomy at all. And the degree to which a vehicle really has some autonomy, well, that's, you've created a monster, it's Frankenstein. That's Frankenstein is a story about giving something autonomy. And it's a warning that autonomy is inherently not what we want. The first solution is to reject the term solution. So solution, like autonomy, was invented partly to misrepresent what uh, technology can do. Technology cannot solve anything. It has never solved anything. People solve things. And when we solve things, we usually solve it with the help of technology. But it's very important to recognize that when a human solves a problem with technology, it is the human empowered by the technology who solves the problem. It is not the technology that solves the problem. Now, if you're in marketing, it's very attractive to misrepresent technology as the solution because it sells better that way. It's like magic. Arthur C. Clarke said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And marketers recognize that and they try to tap that feeling that people have, that technology, amazing technology is magic because it sells things. So to answer your question though, what we need are tools. Tools, unlike solutions, empower the user. They make the user responsible. They give the user choices. The user chooses the tool and the user chooses the job, the task with which to use the tool or for which to use the tool. And we have incredible tools. We have bicycles, conventional bicycles, electric bicycles. We have electric trains that don't need batteries because they draw their power from overhead wires or from a third rail. We have trams. Buses are not perfect, but they're useful. We can make bus stops better. We've spent, just in the USA, $200 billion developing robotic cars. We could have given everybody their own personal bus stop for that cost. So that's what we can do. We can begin by recognizing that we need tools that empower us, the people actually going places, and we need to reject solutions. My expertise about the debate in the South is not very good, so I'm, I don't have a confident answer for you. I can say that in the North, there is an illusion uh, that's part of the marketing that everyone can afford this future that's being sold to us, which is not true in any country on Earth, no matter how rich it is. That illusion is created by the fact that the companies that want to sell it to us are willing to lose lots of money subsidizing their own services. Uh, it costs a company more money to offer a robo-taxi service than they can ever get back. And they're willing to lose that money in the hope that this will eventually convince us that they do have solutions and then they'll have solutions we can't afford. Now if you look at this worldwide, of course, this means that lower income countries are going to have it even worse. In fact, this is a kind of neo-colonialist perspective because to the people who are selling this, they are looking to the global south to supply the minerals, the cobalt, the lithium, the nickel, um, the manganese that will make this happen, the copper as well. And every one of those minerals has devastating effects and there's not enough of them even if we ignored the devastating human and ecological effects of supplying these minerals at the extent to which they're in demand. The name is a mystery, but I'll reveal the mystery now. Um, back in the 1930s, the automobile industry, beginning with General Motors, had a very important insight, and we still live with this insight today. And that insight was, you can sell cars one at a time, and, and that's okay if you want to make some money but you can sell many, many more automobiles. You can sell the roads as well. If you promise a future 
20 years away where everything's perfect because everybody drives all the time, because all the cities are places where you can drive anywhere at any time without delay and park at your destination when you get there. And General Motors was the first company to think of this, not the only one, and they came up with a word for this idea. They called this idea Futurama because they were combining future with diorama, like a display, because they knew that to persuade you that this future was possible, they would have to show it to you vividly, uh, attractively, and they were very ingenious at doing this. Well, I think we're in the fourth generation of this kind of selling of impossible futures. They're impossible, but they're made to seem possible because they're always associated with the latest technology. Well, the latest technology now is the technology that is misnamed autonomous technology. And this is the basis or the justification for the claim that finally, at last, after 100 years, car dependency will finally work. And it's autonomous technology that's supposed to make us believe this. So I decided to connect autonomous with that old promise of Futurama so that we can see it's all one promise. It's, this way we can recognize that it's a promise that has been broken every time before and thereby we can better understand why we should not believe the promise again. Por favor, escribe se no canal José Luxemburgo na YouTube.